Great. Well, thank you for that introduction and thank you to everyone who could make it. Today, I'm gonna to talk about user investments in common pool resources. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about instances where users are investing in improving the economic value of their common pool resource. I'm gonna start the talk out by giving sort of a broad overview of the fisheries economics literature, not to try and do any justice to this rich literature, but rather to summarize the literature that's out there in order to position what I'm gonna talk about today relative to what we already know about common pool resources. And then I'm going to look at two case studies where users are making investments in improving the economic value of their common pool resource. The first case study is a limited entry salmon fishery, a commercial fishery, where users invested in branding and marketing their salmon. And then the second case study is a recreational fishery and actually an inland fishery in the state of Wisconsin where there are a number of different walleye lakes, lakes that have walleye, which are species recreationally caught for consumption. And a lot of these lakes don't have a homeowners association on them. And those are in red in this figure. Some of them do. And some of those homeowners associations are actively investing in purchasing walleye from hatcheries and stocking them in their lakes. So these are the lakes in blue and the lakes that I'll be interested in exploring today. But first, just to start off, a common pool resource, as probably everyone knows, is a resource for which it is difficult to exclude users. And economists, biologists, and other uh, scientists have shown that the collective outcome of a common pool resource is suboptimal. And there can be both biological degradation, meaning that the resource stock is a suboptimally low level, and there's also economic degradation, meaning that the economic value, which uh, we can call economic welfare or fishing rents, is degraded due to incentives that users have to compete with each other and overinvest in inputs to the fishery. So in other words, the level of extraction that's being realized in the system could be realized with spending far less on the cost of uh, productive inputs to fishing. And so there's a lot of models that show that in equilibrium, in pure open access and other types of management regimes, you can have even the complete degradation of economic value, meaning that the gross benefits that harvesters are earning from the fishery are just exactly offset by the opportunity cost or the cost of that extraction. Most fisheries aren't pure open access, at least in the US, there's regulations. And typically regulations are intended to prevent the biological degradation. So managers can put a cap on the total level that's being extracted, such as in a regulated open access system where managers set a total allowable catch to control the level of extraction. And this gets at the biological degradation piece, so can prevent biological degradation, but it doesn't stop the degradation of economic value coming from the system. And that's because common pool resource incentives still persist, users are still competing with each other, and they have incentives to overinvest in inputs to extraction and exploitation, such as um, vessels here that you can see in this cartoon. And some of the richness of the literature in fisheries economics comes from the fact that researchers have explored various mechanisms through which economic value can be degraded. In a really nice set of papers by Homans and Weiland, for example, they look at the case of Pacific halibut and they show that markets can be one mechanism through which economic value is degraded when common pool incentives persist. In their case study, they show that Managers set a total allowable catch or this TAC, but the level of exploitation invested in that fishery is so high such that that TAC can be taken in a very short amount of time. And this means that processors are receiving this large volume of the product in a really compressed window of time, and they have to freeze the product and market it into low value markets for frozen fish, rather than being able to sell the fish as a fresh, higher value product. So in this case, markets are one mechanism that can help to degrade economic value in the system um, when you still have common pool incentives and a race to fish. 
And then one of the management regimes that I'm going to be looking at is limited entry, which characterizes one of my case studies. In limited entry, managers can limit some type of input to fishing. And in this case, they can limit the number of vessels in this cartoon. But that doesn't solve the problem of economic value being degraded in these systems because users have incentives to compete in the race to fish and overinvest in these unregulated inputs to fishing, such as vessel size, technology, et cetera. So what is all this said about investments in common pool resources? Um, I would say that what we know is that there are economic incentives to overinvest in inputs to extraction and overinvest in uh, capital, uh, exploitative capital. But we don't know a lot about other types of investments and specifically investments that users are making in improving the economic value of their resource. We do know that these investments will be shaped by the fact that there are pressures in these systems that degrade any economic value that can be created. So I've put together three overarching questions about these investments that I'm interested in. And I'm gonna present a set of papers and each of the papers I'll talk about gets at one or more of these questions. The first is what are the economic returns to investments in common pool resources? The second is what are the biological implications of user investments in common pool resources? And then finally, what factors drive these investment decisions in these systems? I'll look at these questions using two case studies again. And the first is an example from the Copper River salmon fishery in the state of Alaska, where harvesters invested in branding their product and product quality improvements. The story that I will tell here starts out in the 1980s. In 1980, there was a historically large run of salmon in Bristol Bay, which is Alaska's largest salmon fishery. And this depressed ex-vessel prices throughout the state. And in particular, it depressed ex-vessel prices for harvesters in the Upper Cook Inlet and Copper River fisheries. Harvesters in both of these fisheries went on strike. In the Upper Cook Inlet, processors settled and they raised prices and the season resumed. In the Copper River, uh, the outcome wasn't the same. And so a group of harvesters decided to take matters into their own hands. They decided to bypass, bypass processors completely. And so they collectively got together and collectively paid for the price to ship their salmon to Anchorage, Alaska for custom processing and sale um, into wholesale markets. This turned out to be profitable. So in the following year in 1981, they formed a marketing cooperative, which is a vertically integrated firm where harvesters also control the processing of their salmon. And in that beginning year, their membership was small. It was 5% of the permit holders in the fishery. Pretty quickly, they grew. By 1983, they had their own processing plant and their membership was 24% of the total number of harvesters in this limited entry fishery. In addition to this processing plant, they also made investments in product quality improvements and marketing. They wanted to market their product into high-end restaurants in Seattle, as well as um, into Japanese markets. So they hired a marketing firm to help them access Japanese markets that they previously didn't have access to. They commissioned a logo be designed to brand fish coming out of the Copper River fishery. And they also required that members uh, take a number of quality, product quality improvement steps in their harvesting. Specifically, they required that members remove fish from the drift gill nets with picking hooks. They bleed them, they put them in ice bags, and then they deliver them within six hours of harvest. Um, the, the cooperative did pretty well. I'm going to refer to it as the CRFC. It did pretty well for a while, but then ultimately went bankrupt in 1991 due to a number of factors, including aquaculture salmon flooding the market and depressing prices for wild salmon. In a paper with Cynthia Lynn and Jim Sankirico, we look at both the benefits of these investments as well as the costs. And the benefits were that the CRFC would potentially generate a price premium for harvesters through these investments. 
And the cost side include that it's more costly to spend time on improving product quality, especially in a limited entry fishery where there is a race to fish. Every unit of time you're um, investing in improving the quality of your salmon, you're not out there on the water um, competing in that race, and so you're losing out on fish. So we're interested in both sides, and we use an analysis called difference in differences, which is similar to a backy design that I see being used in natural sciences. And we use the upper cook inlet as a control fishery and estimate that the CRFC, this cooperative, led to a 64 cent per pound increase in prices for sockeye and a $2.03 per pound increase in ex-vessel chinook prices. When we look at our quality metric or the cost side, we look at the number of deliveries per permit holder, number of delivery trips holding the quantity delivered constant. And we find that the CRFC led to a 21% increase in the number of trips that permit holders were making uh, given a constant quantity delivered. Putting these two together in sort of a rough back of the envelope calculation, including cost of a fishing trip, we estimate that there is this short run economic gain from these investments on the order of 1.2 to $2.4 million per year. And then we go on because we're interested in sort of the long-term economic uh, returns to these investments, as well as potential biological implications of these investments in a second paper. And that's particularly because as you can see in the figure in the lower uh, left, that prices are not constant over the season. And in fact, prices fall pretty dramatically over the course of 15 days. And this could be driven due to two things. First, it could be that the Copper River salmon, um, the fishery, the cooperative in that fishery successfully differentiated Copper River salmon, branded this product. So there's a unique market demand for this product. And that would mean that as the quantity of Copper River salmon uh, brought to market increases, prices will fall. It's an endogenous price, meaning that uh, prices are a function of the quantity harvested in this fishery. On the other hand, that may not be the case, and this could just be exogenous seasonality where consumers don't care about copper river salmon particularly, but they are willing to pay more for salmon early in the season, and copper river salmon are some of the first wild salmon brought to market. So you have this uh, seasonality and prices, and we can couple that with the fact that the users or the resource users or the harvesters in the system are targeting a stock complex that's comprised of multiple populations. There's been a lot of great work in SAFs on this exact topic. Um, in our system, biologists have identified, I believe, five uh, individual salmon populations for Copper River Chinook. Here we have data on two of those populations and you can see that they differ in their run timing. And so in our simple bioeconomic model, I use two populations and I generically name them early run salmon and late run salmon. The early run salmon are more likely to arrive in the beginning of the season in the first opening than are the late run salmon. So what this means is that these early run salmon are more valuable and there are potentially population specific values for the various uh, salmon populations in this fishery. So we're interested in what are the outcomes when you have population diversity, population specific values due to potentially the successful branding of salmon from a region. We explore this in a bioeconomic model. I'm not gonna get into the model equations, but I'll give you a sense of how this works. Oh wait, I have two questions here that I'm just noticing. Let me see, how do I? Oh, I don't know. The first question is that my history of the co-op said it went bankrupt in 1991, and yet there's this huge spike in Chinook prices between then and 2000. What was the relationship between the co-op that you study and what we now know, yes, yeah, so, uh, now know as uh, Copper River Salmon, and what was done in the 90s that was so effective? That's a really good question from Chris Anderson. 
Um, and I will say, you know, going back to the prices um, that the investments that the Copper River, uh, the CRFC made, the co-op made, were not necessarily only um, benefiting CRFC members. And there were a lot of spillovers. And part of it is I think that they successfully branded salmon from that region, but not necessarily just from their cooperative. And so there are a lot of um, spillovers. And I think that their investments have had long run um, benefits that have outlived the cooperative itself. And the second is any evidence of, for changes in portfolio effects over time. I have not looked at that. So I'll talk about what we are gonna look at. This is more of a conceptual model of what does it mean to brand salmon um, from a region and potentially create an endogenous price for that salmon. What does that mean for economic returns in the long run, for population diversity in the long run? Um, and, and so that's what we're gonna explore in sort of more of a conceptual analysis. We haven't looked for this in the data. So we start the model off in this white box, which is the initial conditions to the model. We assume that the two salmon populations have the same number of salmon in each population. So they have the same level to start the model off. And then those adult salmon feed into a model of migration. They, the migration is from the PDFs that you saw on a previous slide. So stochastic draws from that. And then there's harvest in this limited entry fishery, which is regulated, meaning managers will shut down the fishery after the TAC has been met. And whatever is not harvested escapes and there is reproduction. So this second purple box and this reproduction is stochastic. We use stochastic Ricker growth equations for the two populations. And then there's a cycle advance, which is six years in a cycle because that's based on the life cycle of Chinook salmon from the Copper River. And then in the next cycle, you have adults that again feed into the fishery. So we run this model forward. And it's stochastic, we have 10,000 model runs. Most of what I present is gonna be the mean from those runs. So. Oops. Okay, and so we're gonna look at this and we're gonna look at this under three different price scenarios. The first is seasonal prices where prices are not a function of how much has been caught in the Copper River fishery. It's just exogenous seasonality in prices. The second scenario is endogenous prices where this can capture this idea that you have regional branding and a unique market demand for Copper River salmon and prices are a function of what's being harvested in the Copper River fishery. And then we compare it to a baseline of constant prices. And we fit all of the parameters in these various price equations from the one season that we have a high frequency price data. And so to the results, here are the first set of results that looks at on the y-axis, the relative abundance of early run salmon and on the x-axis is cycle, so that's time, and those are six year periods of time, so it represents 60 years here. And the first finding is that regardless of the price scenario, even when prices are constant, so the dark gray line, you have a degradation in population diversity, and there's been some research, I think, again in SAFs that has shown empirical evidence for this in another fishery, um, but we're finding that this is, also happening in our model. And that's because when managers shut the fishery down as the TAC has been met, then it effectively protects late run salmon populations. So you have this decline in the relative abundance of early run salmon. The second finding that I think is a little more um, interesting is that when you have endogenous prices, and this is again, prices that are a function of how much has been harvested, then there's both negative and positive feedbacks going on. And so you can see that by comparing the, the medium gray line to the light gray line. And at first, the seasonal prices where prices are not a function of what's being harvested in the Copper River fishery, at first that has a larger impact on the relative abundance of early run salmon, but ultimately endogenous prices has uh, the largest impact over a longer period of time. 
And this is because at first the negative feedbacks dominate. And those negative feedbacks are such that if you bring too much early run salmon population, uh, too much salmon to the market in early in the season, then you depress prices. And so that disincentivizes fishing too hard on that early run salmon population. But over time, there is a degradation in the early run salmon population, and that restricts how much you can bring to the market and drives up prices that incentivizes even more intensive fishing on this population. And then we look at fishery value with constant prices. It doesn't matter when you're harvesting your salmon. And so the fishery value is not changing over time. With seasonal prices, you see the sharpest declines in the fishery value over the long run. And that's because as the relative abundance of the early run salmon population is degraded, then you're left harvesting more and more late run salmon or salmon later in the season, and those are worth less. Endogenous prices through regional branding actually serves to protect the economic value of the fishery because even though you're degrading the early run salmon population and you're bringing less to market um, early in the season, prices can remain high until you end up saturating the market. And so the high prices can shift later and later into the season over time. And then finally, we look at the variability here on the y-axis is the variability in financial returns. And on the x-axis is the uh, variability in physical returns or the variability in salmon. And the key point here is that there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the coefficient of variation in salmon returning to the fishery and how variable economic returns are. And the mapping really depends on the market conditions in the fishery. I have another question, so let me take a second. So the question is, what are the drivers of the declining price over time? Is the early run salmon better? Pent up demand, desire to be an early adopter, uh, take a few days to saturate the market, yeah, so the 50% price drop is pretty substantial. And this is a question by Chris. And I will say that I, I don't know, and I can't um, actually say, I haven't done an, a test, whether prices are actually endogenous here or whether that's exogenous, because maybe the early run salmon are better. Uh, they have longer to swim to get to their spawning ground. So maybe they've accumulated more fat. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, um, but I could. I think it could be a number of these things, a combination of these things. I do think that Copper River salmon are a rare example of a branded seafood product. You really just don't see much of that on the market. Okay. So our next case study is the, oops, I'm trying to get rid of, all right. Um, recreational walleye fisheries in Wisconsin. And so in this figure, you can see bubbles and the size of the bubbles represents uh, the number per acre that are being stocked in various lakes. And the color of the bubbles represents who's doing the stocking. So the green bubbles are the public entity that I'm calling it here, and that's the Wisconsin DNR. And then the red bubbles are lake associations, which again, are these groups of homeowners that are doing the stocking. And here we have a paper in review where we're interested in the economic returns to these investments, as well as the driver. So this is the first time that we're starting to model these investment decisions in a common pool resource setting. Um, I would say that the Wisconsin fishery for walleye, this recreational fishery is pretty much a classic open access fishery in the fact that there's a nominal license fee, but an unlimited number of licenses. And even though there are bag limits at these various lakes, it doesn't control, you know, how many people are on the lakes, how many days they fish and so on. So um, there's really not a lot of direct control over the level of extraction in this system. And all of the lakes that homeowners live on, that they're um, forming lake associations and stocking, these all have a public access. 
our approach um, first is to develop a bioeconomic model of the optimal stocking rates. It's a simple model. We're trying to gain intuition here. It's a single site, so a single lake. And there's two angler pools, resident anglers who live on the lake and can form lake associations, and then roving anglers who don't live on the lakes and are free to choose to you know, harvest uh, on the lake or not. And then we model the problem for two different types of managers. We call the first type of manager the local manager. This is the lake association. And the second is the central manager, which is the Wisconsin DNR. Um, we parameterize the model with data where we can. We rely on numerical solutions due to uh, properties of our analytical solutions. And then we compare our modeled outcomes of stocking rates to data for actual stocking rates for 46 lakes in two counties in Wisconsin that I'll show you later. First, I'll start by presenting the model framework. And here we borrow from a classic model of an open access fishery. It was developed for a commercial fishery by Vernon Smith in 1968. And um, we apply it to a recreational fishery. I'm happy to answer questions about um, you know what that means but for now i'll just walk through the model as if we're describing a recreational open access fishery the first assumption in the model is that all users resource users are identical in that they all receive the average returns to effort the total returns is denoted by pi here and to get the average just we divide by the total amount of effort which is capital e the total returns to fishing effort is the harvest Q, which is a catchability coefficient multiplied by the fishing effort, multiplied by the walleye biomass is total harvest. And we multiply that by the willingness to pay for that harvest that recreational anglers have. And then the returns also have a cost piece where there's a cost of fishing effort. We assume a constant marginal cost. And then again, we divide by the total level of effort in the fishery to get the average returns. And this is what all the users receive. So this is what motivates their decisions. And you can see that in the second equation, which is an E dot equation, which is the instantaneous rate of change of effort or the change in effort over time. And this is a function of those average returns. When average returns are positive, it means that anglers are enjoying um, a net benefit from their fishing. And that attracts more entry into the fishery. People uh, are getting a benefit, they wanna do more of it. When the average returns are zero, then the E dot equation is set equal to zero, meaning that no one has an incentive to either enter or exit. And then when the average returns are negative, there's exit from the fishery. The value that I receive from my harvest is not um, compensating me for the cost that I had to spend to get there. And then the E dot equation also has this delta function, which is a sluggishness function, which captures the fact that anglers aren't uh, responding instantly to changes in the average returns to their effort. And in a recreational fishery, you can think that the sluggishness might come from the fact that Anglers are making expectations about the returns to their effort, and they're relying on um, the past to make those expectations. So there's a lag period before their expectations can catch up with reality, creating a sluggishness there. Okay, there's two, there's two questions, so I'll take a minute. The first is Andre, and it says, is the linear E versus F relationship appropriate for this type of recreational fishery? Um, I also look at power forms. Is the linear E versus F? Uh, I'm assuming F is harvest and should harvest really be linear in effort? Is that the question? Andre, yeah, you should be that. Yeah, I don't know the, the, the term in economics, but basically normally we'd raise E to a power um, because the, the relationship is rarely linear between E, which is effort, and F, which is mortality, which you're assuming. And usually that affects dynamics quite dramatically, as you showed yeah. in the previous example. Okay, yeah, so, right. Um, 
We did not explore that. We did explore a case where um, there's not a constant uh, marginal cost of fishing effort. So I think it sort of contains some of the same properties in that the average returns aren't linear in effort, but there is a concavity there. Um, and we find that our general model results hold, although I didn't explore some nonlinear relationship between harvest and effort. Um, okay. And then in, Chris Anderson has a question. In commercial fishing models, the private benefit is linear in catch. What are the implications of using this for recreational fisheries? Okay, um, so I'll, I'll come back to this question. And here we can see that for the E dot equation, as I said, when the average returns are equal to zero, um, then effort isn't changing. What that means is that in equilibrium, the economic value is completely degraded or the net benefits from recreational angling are completely degraded. That is extreme probably for a, a recreational fishing uh, setting a recreational fishery setting because typically we assume that the utility function is concave and you know catch and the other attributes meaning that the net benefits won't be completely degraded and so i will say that this model is sort of the under the most dire you know constraints do we see incentives for stocking what do those look like um, but i think in reality there's probably not complete rent dissipation or complete dissipation of welfare in the system. Um, and then, so that's the E dot equation that describes effort dynamics. The reason why we sort of first went to this model, just to give a little motivation, is that there's not an analog of this model for recreational fisheries. And that's something I'm currently working on right now. Um, but this is a model that a lot of people are really familiar with. It's really easy to understand what's driving what. And so there's some benefits of using the model, but as Chris and maybe some others pointed out, it doesn't perfectly fit our setting, but it is an area that I think is, is really important and I'm, I'm actively working there. Okay, and so then the second equation to describe the system dynamics is this x dot equation, which is the instantaneous rate of change in the walleye biomass. Here we have a logistic growth function g, and then we have um, that the instantaneous rate of change of walleye biomass is also affected by the harvest rate, again, uh, linear in effort. So there are two modifications that we make to the model. First, we allow for stocking to increase the walleye population, so the stocking rate appears in the x dot equation. And then second, we have two angler pools, both resident anglers and roving anglers. Residents, again, live on the lake um, and roving anglers don't, but they are free to fish at that lake. Both angler pools have their own effort dynamics. And this is because the anglers are different with respect to the average returns or the parameters that determine the returns to their fishing effort. And specifically, we assume that resident anglers have lower access costs than roving anglers. And what that means is necessarily, they also have a lower willingness to pay for what they're catching. If they had lower access costs and a higher willingness to pay, then you would never see any roving anglers in the system in equilibrium. And we're only interested in scenarios in which both angler groups are present in equilibrium because that's what we see in our data, is that there's active participation by both groups. To look at optimal stocking rates, we specify an objective function for the local manager and the central manager, and that is that they are choosing a stocking rate to maximize the net present value in their system. So they're discounting. The discount rate shows up as the row parameter here. And what they're discounting is the net benefits from fishing in that walleye fishery. And they're only considering, the local manager is only considering resident anglers, so the net benefits to that user group. And they're also considering the cost of stocking. Here we specify a quadratic cost in stocking. And they're going to maximize these. Again, in equilibrium, the net benefits from fishing in the walleye fishery are driven to zero. So what's really going to motivate 
these investment decisions is that we're not always in equilibrium. It's the transient welfare gains that are going to potentially drive these investment decisions. And they're going to solve that maximization problem subject to um, the effort dynamics and the dynamics of the walleye population that we saw in a previous slide. The central manager is similar, um, but this time they are also considering the roving angler population and the net benefits that the roving angler population is receiving from participating in this fishery. So here are some results. I'll start with the results I think that are more intuitive. And um, in panel A, the equilibrium optimal stocking rate is on the y-axis and the equilibrium resident fishing effort as a fraction of total uh, fishing effort or as a percent of total fishing effort is on the x-axis. We can see that local managers, these lake associations, are going to stock more when there's more uh, residents in equilibrium, which is not surprising, but the solid purple line is upward sloping. The central manager in the solid yellow line is going to stock less the more resident anglers there are in equilibrium. And that's, again, because roving anglers have a higher willingness to pay. So they're getting higher net benefits from the stocking decision by the central manager. When we look at what happens when the access costs are equal, so these dashed line, which means the willingness to pay for catch is also equal, then we see that the central manager doesn't care who's there. They stock the same amount, no matter uh, if effort is primarily roving anglers or primarily resident anglers, but lake associations still are driven by the number of resident anglers in the angler pool. The bottom panel is the welfare gains over a no stocking baseline, showing that welfare gains from the central manager's decisions who internalizes benefits to both of the groups are always higher, but these two start to look similar to each other as resident anglers make more of make up more of that angler pool in equilibrium. Okay, so these results I think are maybe a little less intuitive, but we start this model off and I'm going to focus on panel A. The y axis is the time discounted net benefits and the x axis is time. So we're looking at net benefits over time and we start this model off in equilibrium. So in equilibrium, the net benefits are driven to zero. So if you don't stock, you're going to have zero net benefits across all the time that we're considering, right? You're going to stay in that equilibrium. If you do stock, at first you get negative net benefits, and that's because the walleye biomass is, you know, overexploited, it's degraded, it's low. You're stocking, that's expensive, but you're still not getting a lot of benefits from that. But over time, your stocking builds up the walleye biomass and there's positive gains. Users are sluggishly entering the fishery and they do so um, so much that eventually the net gains go down because they're starting to bring the wild, walleye biomass down through their entry and increased effort. At a certain point in time, the net benefits from stocking uh, intersect zero and become negative, right? So here, you're at a new equilibrium, the net benefits have been completely degraded, but you're still paying these stocking costs uh, and you're sort of getting no benefit. So why do it? We look at um, what would happen if you switch to not stocking as soon as the net benefits in the system were driven back down to zero. And what would happen is that if you stop stocking, now the users are going to have to transition to a new equilibrium with a lower walleye biomass and that's going to be a painful transition. They're going to have negative net benefits along the way and so in this region here you're stocking to avoid losses rather than for any gains in the system. Okay finally we compare this to data and again it's from 46 lakes on two counties in Wisconsin. And we find general support for this idea that lake associations stock more when there's more resident um, anglers in the angler pool. This is panel B. And the central manager stocks less. We also, for each of these 46 lakes, um, parameterize our model with data from that lake to predict their optimal stocking rates and the walleye density that emerges from that model and see how that compares to the actual stocking rates. 
And we find that um, we're closer for lake associations, although they're stocking less than our model predicts they would. Um, we're farther off for the central manager um, and they're stocking more than our model says that they would. So we look at this and in the paper, we talk about reasons why it may be that the Wisconsin DNR is stocking um, with effort as an objective or ecological objectives, or there might be political pressure here. So in a final paper, we're taking a next step. So far, I've talked about the stocking decisions and optimal stocking and optimal investment in a single site. But what's interesting about our research setting is that there is a number of different lakes and they're spatially interconnected through the roving angler pool. What that means is that when there's the spatial interconnection, the investment decision at Lake I is going to have impacts for neighboring lakes. When I invest in stocking my lake, I potentially draw roving angler effort away from your lake and to my lake and that benefits you. Whenever there's these spillovers from our investments, then there can be gains from coordinating um, these investment decisions. And we're interested in what those spillovers are and what the benefits from coordination could be in our system. And we have some data, but before we explore the data, we really want to get intuition about this. So we develop a model with slightly more complexity. Now there's two lakes. So you can see that the X dot equation has an I subscript, meaning that I'm looking at lake I. Here I have a more realistic model of um, fishing effort. And this model of fishing effort the, for the resident angler pool, F of I, uh, um, is the fishing at Lake I for the resident pool. It comes as a solution to a utility maximization problem where anglers have preferences for catch and non-catch attributes. Um, and so that's the solution there. For the roving angler pool, we also have uh, the solution to the UMAX problem or the utility maximization problem, but we're modifying this by a sigma function that defines the fraction of the total roving angler pool that is fishing on Lake I. And that's a function of the utility differential between lakes I and J. And so that's that delta IJ function there. It's positive when I is more attractive than J. And then there's a tuning parameter K that tunes how sensitive anglers are to differentials and utility across the two lakes. And so this is a smooth approximation to a heavy side function and the K can um, determine how steep the, the slope is. We can solve this problem analytically for the optimal stocking rate, similar to what we did before, but now we can actually get an analytical solution. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this equation, but it's the steady state stocking level, optimal stocking level at Lake I. And then we can look at how that steady state stocking level changes when the biomass at a neighboring Lake J changes. And we see that the stocking that I wanna do is actually increasing in the stocking at a neighboring lake or the biomass at a neighboring lake if uh, this term here is negative. And you can think about that term as um, the change in the responsiveness to my stocking when my neighbor's walleye biomass goes up. So if my neighbor stocks, then the roving angler pool might be more responsive to my stocking decision, and then I'm not gonna wanna stock as much. But if the neighbor stocks and that dampens the roving angler's responsiveness to my stocking, then I wanna stock more when they're stocking. And so it's interesting, we can see this when we look at the sigma function here, which is again, the fraction of the roving angler pool fishing on Lake I. It's zero when the delta IJ is large and negative. That means that Lake I is much more attractive than, uh, Lake J is much more attractive than Lake I. Here, when my lake, Lake I, is much more attractive than Lake J, then all of the roving angler pool is on my lake. We can look at the change in that, or the derivative of that function, and that is um, proportional to the responsiveness of the roving angler pool to my stocking decision. 
And we can see that this responsiveness is a function of the delta ij as the stock or the biomass at my neighbor's lake increases, then I move along the x-axis from the right to the left. And you can see there's this range over where I'm moving, where the, the responsiveness of the roving angler pool to my stocking is increasing when my neighbor has a larger biomass. And then there's this range over which it's decreasing. But it only really changes um, in this uh, narrow range where the lakes are pretty similar to each other. Given what we know about spatial dynamics in these systems, it's likely that the net benefits are fairly well equalized across space. So it's very likely that we are in these situations where there's not huge utility differentials between various lakes. And so our stocking decisions should um, have this element of strategic spatial interaction. However, I do want to say that this is unfortunate for us because ideally you'd get a theoretical result that you can uh, then test in the data, but when you have an ambiguous theoretical result, um, it doesn't really give you guidance for what you would expect from the data. Okay, wrapping up. We observe different user investments in improving common pool resources. I've talked about two, there's others. Marine Stewardship Council certification is one that probably comes to mind for a lot of people here. But we don't know a lot about these types of investments, their returns and biological and ecological implications from the fisheries economics literature. It really hasn't been the focus although these are, um, in my opinion, interesting economic questions. And I will just say that there's a lot more to explore here. We're just taking first steps. And I'll acknowledge everyone on this slide has directly contributed to the research that I talked about today. All right, thank you, Sunny, for a great talk. Um, so at this time, we can take questions. Um, as the audience, you can submit questions via the chat, or you can use the hand raise feature. Um, it is up to you. Oh, we have a question from Chris Anderson. So Chris, go ahead and unmute yourself. Is that what I just did? Sure did. Excellent. Um, so, so maybe that this is, uh, thanks for the talk, really a lot of interesting um, questions and angles, and you know, it's neat that there's a, a lot of questions still to pursue in each of these projects. Um, I'm kind of wondering, or noticing that in both projects, there was sort of the, the marketing cooperative and the lakes that are doing their own stocking investments. There's sort of this property where the members of the co-op are producing um, uh, something that benefits them, but um, is also generating benefits for other people. Um, have you tapped into kind of the, um, the club good literature at all to see um, what the effects, what some of the basic results are in common pool resources where there are these types of spillovers? I have not sort of done any sort of modeling with that type of um, sort of framework. Uh, what we're doing now for the investing in stocking lakes is we're starting to think about this as potentially a game theory where you are sort of making investment decisions that depends on your neighbor, but your neighbor is also making investment decisions that depend on you. Um, that's not necessarily what you're, what you're suggesting though, in terms of a club good. But yeah, I do think um, that would be a neat framework, which we could look at this, especially potentially the marketing cooperative, because I do think that their investments, even though they went bankrupt, uh, they the benefits to those really outlive them and so it, it might explain why you see uh, so few of these investments being made but sort of understanding 
why anyone would make these investments or when they could be made successfully, I think is um, something I'm still really interested in learning more about. Look like we have any other questions right now. Give people a second though. I guess I have a I have a question sort of about the um, in the last case with the uh, community like the how do the how do the individual um lake what a lake cooperatives um make stocking decisions um that is a good question and i think that's something that we would like to bring data to you can see that we have a lot of um, information about the dependent variable this figure that i have here is um, just from one year. So we have this over a long period of time, I think starting in 2003 all the way to 2017. So we have this panel data set and we have good information again about the dependent variable, but we don't have all of the independent variables that we would love to have to be able to model this in a rigorous way. And particularly though Wisconsin DNR does creel surveys and collects information about effort, as well as they do population estimates for walleye on lakes, but they only sample, I think around 3% of the lakes per year. And then once they sample them, they do them over time. So on a you know almost daily basis throughout the summer. Um, so you have a lot of richness um, at a given lake over the season, but we don't have enough information to sort of model how the roving angler population is moving across this landscape in a way that we think affects the decisions here. So, um, you know, we, we can put together a model that says we think that they're maximizing these benefits subject to these constraints, but I don't think we have as much information as we'd like to be able to test our models rigorously. Thank you. Let's give it another second here if anyone has any more questions. All right. Well, thank you, Sunny, for a, for a great talk. Um, it's great to see all of that work. Uh, and this is the last quantitative seminar for the quarter.